Hello, I'm Mark Russell. I'm coach and strategist for the British Sailing Team, and I'm author of the RYA Tactics, which my sponsors have insisted that I tell you is available right now from my website. So last week, Simon introduced some, Simon Rowell introduced some principles of forecasting and uh, encouraged us to use what we see on the water and what we've learned from the forecast to make a bit more sense of what is going on for us in real life. Today, I'm gonna to suggest how you might use some of that understanding to come up with your race strategy. So what do I mean by a strategy? It's definitely not a set of directions or instructions telling you exactly where to go and when. Even the most predictable venues are more complicated than that. Throw in a bit of weather, other boats and so on, and it's way too complicated to be able to set off with an absolute idea of which piece of water you're gonna be on and when. It's more like a list of priorities, giving the building blocks for the quick decisions you need to make all the way around the waste course. The big picture, that's why I've got a picture of a big picture. So where to start, whether to duck or tack, whether to split or follow, whether to cover, all of those small choices are made with the big picture, the list of priorities in mind. Right feels good. That is actually a real quote from one of the best sailors in the country. And uh, however I tried, I couldn't get him or her to explain exactly what it was that made right feel good. I guess what I'm saying there is, if you don't have a process that you can explain to anybody else, but you make good strategic decisions all the time, don't worry about it. Carry on, just carry on doing what you're doing. However, some sailors find they never do so well in the big races as they do in training ones, even when the competition is just as hot. Now, I think that's because they're often relying on their speed, their boat handling, and their good boat on boat tactics, and simply reacting to the situations as they come up. Once they find themselves in a fleet with more depth, with no big picture, you, you end up getting yourself forced out to the edges of the course with no real route back into the game. I'm gonna use my three circles model as an example of how the forecast might help you to pick the prior right priorities. If you understand the world in a different way, that's no problem. I'm sure you can find your own way to incorporate the forecast into your big picture. The three circles model suggests that at any particular time, one of three things will shape our strategy. If we know which one of those is key at any time, we know what cues we should be looking for, and we know what the next choice should be based on. The first category is wind shifts. If the shifts are following a regular pattern, uh, and they're going at least once each way over the length of the beat, hopefully more, and there are no other obvious ways to gain an advantage. The shortest route up the beat has got to be tacking on the shifts. Every time you're headed below the mean, you tack. Key here is it doesn't matter what the other boats are doing, so long as you stay in phase with the shifts. This is all about sailing the shortest route up the beat. Your focus stays on the compass or on your angles compared with the other boats, the land or the waves. That is pure shift sailing. The next category is what I call a gain. A gain could come from a traditional land effect, a wind bend, more wind or tide on one side of the course. That's a regular gain feature. Or the gain might come from sailing to the next patch of pressure. That could appear anywhere on the race course, and it might not be in the same place next time. When I'm in gains mode, I'm always trying to drive my boat as quickly as possible to the next part of the, to, the, to a particular part of the racetrack. That's all that matters. Here's a simple example. The wind bend gives a continued advantage to the left-hand side of the race course. I'm sorry, some of the sails are on the wrong side. It's an old drawing. With a gains hat on, all the focus is getting the boat to the area of gain as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So your starting strategy, all of your decisions, everything has that in mind. 
Of course, sometimes it's just not that clear. The shifts are completely wacky. We've got no idea what's going to happen next. Nothing is clear. So what do we know? What we know is where the marks are and where the other boats are. My strategy when I'm in positioning mode is to put my boat where there's the least chance of losing places and the best chance of gaining them if something changes. The positioning rules, they actually stop you making a big loss rather than giving you a perfect winning solution. The first, the, the first and most obvious positioning rule is long tack first. Choose the tack that takes you closest to the next mark, next mark. Everybody knows about that one. You've possibly got lots of other positioning rules of thumb. Cross the bunch when you can, bank the gains, avoid the ley lines, and so on. If you want to see my positioning rules in full, you'll find them on, our, on my video website on that link. So is it really that simple? Well, not really, of course. Eventually, however big the shifts are, you do have to think about where the marks are. Positioning will always come into play at some stage of the beat. And the circles do overlap. Sometimes life is a compromise. But if you know what's first on your list at any time, you're less likely to make big errors. And I always think that a well-executed average plan usually beats no plan at all. So now let's look at some of the ideas that Simon gave you last week and see how this fits in with the big circle. <clears throat> An inversion means there's cold air trapped below warm air. There's not much winning wind coming down from above. It's likely to be light. Changes are going to be slow, at least until it warms up. I call this a lazy wind. It's not going to be particularly gusty or shifty. The biggest gains are likely to come from sailing in more pressure. As we've said, that pressure will not move down the course very quickly. Right now, I'd have my gains hat on. I'd spend the time before the start working out where the nearest area of pressure, good, good pressure is, and I'd make sure that my start gets me there as quickly as possible. I'd keep looking around for the next good patch of pressure. It may not be in the same place next time. Right now, I'd also keep my eye on those, cum those cumulus clouds. If they start to build, that's an indication that the land is heated enough to get some circulation going and the gusts will soon come to the fore. I'll be dusting off my shift hat in that case. Here's a picture of Japan that Simon shared with you. Same story. Inversion with patches of pressure. You can see them on the water, but as he said, it's not going to stay like this all day. Okay, Simon talked a little bit about land effects and used the Carrick Roads as an example. First, I'd like to look at these yellow areas on the east side. I think even the amateur forecasters amongst us uh, can predict that racing in those areas is going to be pretty all over the place. The only things we can be certain about are where the marks are and where the other boats are. That's where my focus would be if I were racing there. I would definitely have my positioning hat on. Over here on the dark side, as Simon calls it, is where the red arrows rule. It looks like there might be some more wind on the left-hand side of the beat there due to compression. I'd certainly check that out as soon as I got to the race area. And if I did find that uh, before the start, I'd be polishing up the gains hat again. Here's Simon's diagram of a frontal system as it moves, as, it, as seen from the side. It's moving from left to right. Sailing over here in the cold sector, I'd expect a fairly clear sky. The air in a low pressure system is already unstable. Any surface heating will make it more so. That's going to emphasize the shifts. I'd be checking them out with my compass as soon as I'm allowed to get out there. Later on in the day, the, this line of cloud will warn me of the approaching front. It's a warm front. And the forecast would have told me how much of a sh right shift I'm expecting when it arrives. The lower the cloud gets as it comes over, as it comes over the top of me, the lower the cloud gets, the more I'll be looking for a gain on the right hand side. If the wind starts to go right, it'll probably keep going to the forecast direction. 
I'm definitely looking for a gain if I'm sailing in that sort of area. Once I'm in the warm sector over here, the clouds will be the key. If they're low and unbroken, as in this diagram, the shifts will be very long. Pressure will be slow moving, bandy, as Simon called it. If the clouds are broken, they'll be affecting the wind individually, as Simon described, as they track across the course. In either case, I'm looking for the long-term gains I can get by sailing to the best part of each beat. That will involve digging into the headers and the pressure rather than tacking as soon as my compass is on a particular number. And my focus will be up above. Those clouds are giving me a real clue as to what's going on next. And then I'm gonna make sure I'm home well before the cold front light arrives. I don't like sailing in the rain. You're welcome to brave the rain and work out what's gonna work out here. So that's my time up. I hope that I've encouraged you to develop your, way, your own way of using the forecast to help you to shape your strategy. And to use the time you have before the start to check out your theory and give you confidence in your plan. Think back to your big races last year. See if you can remember any particular forecast weather conditions and match them to what was the winning strategy. We haven't looked at thermal or sea breezes yet. What do you think would be the winning strategy in those conditions? Remember a sea breeze because of the action of the breeze is, is capped to a certain extent, it's a relatively stable wind. So any land, land effects might be more marked. Hopefully that's given you something you can test when you get back on the water. Meanwhile, sorry that this presentation is recorded and not live. If you have any questions, send them through and we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks for watching.